Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing well, Bryce. How are you? Really good, thank you. Yeah, beautiful day outside today. It's it's weird because we're we're in July, so we're yeah. technically a little over halfway through the year, and it just it seems crazy to me, wild to me that we're already talking about course today's topic which is the best of the year so far and crazy that we're even talking about this now it's wild i uh i always look forward to our best of the year episodes last year we started doing this kind of mid-year check-in because there was just so much great stuff and i i just i preparing for this episode i went back and forth between uh oh i'm i'm so excited to talk about these titles slash what do you mean the year's half over i i where did the time go oh yeah exactly the year is absolutely flying by and uh yeah i'm this is i think gonna become one of my i don't know about you but this is gonna i think become one of my kind of favorite kind of reoccurring themed episodes it's always fun we we love looking back and um kind of sharing our lists anyway of you know some of the things that that we're enjoying so um yeah normally we would do a uh, by the way it's just caroline and myself on yeah, today's just, episode so yeah, i should that. mention that but uh yeah normally we do like an overdue we talk about our overdue fines during this part, yeah. but um, today we're going to skip over that because really it's just a big overdue fine segment today, right? Exactly. And uh, I think that it's it's good because this keeps us current. And we just, just before we started uh, recording, we were talking about how, you know, there's just so much stuff out there that you, you get caught up on. And uh, I know for, that for me, part of the first part of a year is always about kind of catching up on what came out at the tail end of the previous year, you know, trying to see Oscar nominated movies, or sometimes there can be um, a bit of a wait if I'm on hold for like the hottest book of fall. And then I might get it, you know, in early the next year. So there's always a bit of catching up. There's always obviously going back and reading what we consider to be our classics or watching or listening to. So this is good knowing that we have the mid I keep calling it mid-year, which is what we call our performance appraisal cycle. We have our year end and our mid-year PA, but knowing we have this kind of check in and then again at the end of the year, it, it keeps us focused on on some of the new stuff that's coming out yeah it does and i mean it, it's funny working on the podcast with you because yeah there's definitely stuff that it kind of helps keep me on my toes like i'm good in the movies department like i yeah. i go to probably way too many movies in the, in the theater but as far as like uh, sometimes books go um or especially music too it's i'm always like okay i should really like Let's check out this book. So it'll give me a chance to chat about it on the podcast and uh, discover some uh, new titles. So uh, yeah, this is this is always fun to uh, kind of share uh, what we've kind of considered to be some of our favorite titles so far this year uh, that you can borrow from us uh, here at EPL. Before we get started sharing our favorite uh, picks of the year so far, Caroline, I've got a question for you. I'm ready. Why should kids get to have all the fun? Bryce, we've done over 100 episodes together, and I think that you know, I firmly believe children should not have all the fun. Yeah, it's, it is almost criminal, the amount of fun that kids get to have over adults. So that's why we are once again launching EPL's Summer Reading Club for adults. So from June 25th to August 27th, both adults and teens can sign up for Summer Reads 23. Keep track of your reading this summer and complete some fun activities to have your name entered to win our grand prize of a, get this Caroline, a Lego Ideas typewriter. Whoa. I've got it actually at my desk right now uh, at the library and it takes all my willpower not to open it up and start putting it together. It's 
it's awesome. Yeah, I was going to ask if the uh, if if it somehow it had worked its way into the copy uh, that uh, the prize was a gently used Lego typewriter. Maybe on our next episode, <laughs> I will change the read a little bit so it will say gently used. You know, I just I need to make sure all the pieces are there for whoever wins. It, Quality basically. testing. You yeah, know, exactly. We, absolutely. Get but no, started. it is very very cool and has generated a lot of excitement. Yeah, and we're also giving away some gift cards to Edmonton businesses, including Snow Valley. So you can sign up at epl.ca slash summer dash reads. Um, or, of course, go visit Caroline and uh, go pick up uh, go pick up your activity sheet in the branch as well. Yeah, this is always a, a fun promotion. You were actually telling me, I think it was yesterday, yep. that you've seen like a ton of interest in it this year. Yeah, for sure. I, one of EPL's signature kind of events is the Summer Reading Club for Kids. Summer starts at EPL. In the past, kind of, you know, as uh, parents are signing up with their kids, we've said, oh, we also have this for you. And people are like, oh, that's cool. And then they go, we've had people coming in specifically to sign up for summer reads this year we already have some completed entries people are on top of their reading so uh it's been really exciting to see yeah no that's great and yeah participate and uh, it's always fun to uh be like caroline and myself we technically keep track of our reading and watching stuff for, for this show so it's it's fun to do i did want to put a question out to our listeners and to you bryce one of the uh prize packages for the summer starts the children's summer reading club um event is the zach hyman prize package and this includes the uh, books that he's written and some Oilers stuff in it. Kids are so excited about this package. They just light up. They're they're like they love this the books. They love uh, him as a player. I got to wondering if we had a Euler author prize for the adult summer reading club who do you think would be like crafting some kind of novella short story for adults i would think uh so talking about current players because i was gonna say like because wing gretzky and mark messier have both yeah. released books so that would Thank be you. kind of yeah. my pick but maybe let's let's go connor mcdavid because like you have to think like he's gonna have a book out at some point yeah, I think that's a good one. But if any of our listeners um, have any other ideas on, you know, which Euler in their spare time might be writing under a pen name, um, publishing already, perhaps, uh, let us know. Absolutely. By the way, Zach Hyman, uh, we should work on it, would be an would be a dream guest to try and get on the podcast. Oh, that would be lovely. We'll have to work on that. Caroline, let's let's start sharing, you know, some of our favorite titles uh, so far this year. So like past best of the year episodes, uh, today's going to be one big overdue finds segment. So let's jump right in with books. Caroline, uh, do you have a favorite book that you've read so far this year? I do. And I've already talked about it on the show. You've accurately predicted it it is <laughs> bad cree by jessica johns which came out earlier this year uh january i believe um i talked about it a couple episodes ago and then in our uh last episode autumn talked about it as well um just really encourage people to check it out it's kind of a a horror land-based horror that um really brings together a lot of neat and important themes around identity and family and connection, um, uh, grief and mourning, uh, location and your ties to your own personal history and your community. Um, just a really uh, engaging read that I, I highly recommend um, for people to check out. Uh, I did want to give an honorable mention to Spare, by Prince Harry, uh, which uh, came out like I the problem the it's not on my best book list because spare in my opinion p 
peaked with the cover and title reveal when that came out like that was just like that gut punch moment and nothing was going to live up to that even with his like revelations on there if you were following media at any point during the release of spare you pretty much need know all you need to know about it and if you've seen like the harry and megan documentary or some of the other news stories around it you know like it's the same it's the same story and they're telling it they're involved with it so i don't know that you need to read it but when it came out it was big like i was reading it there were other people on their breaks reading it um uh you know connecting with friends and being like have you read it which part are you on like all of this and then like getting together to dissect it so it was like that experience of reading that communal um piece around like can you believe this part or why would he include this or like all of that so i'm not re- saying that uh you need necessarily need to check out spare if you haven't yet but i will give a shout out to the experience of reading spare and then uh, a late entry on this is a is a category I've created because again it's not going to be the best book I've read this year but especially for summer this is coming out in July the best beach read for sure is Summer Stage by Meg Mitchell Moore nothing happens in this book it's set in a kind of east coast beach island that you need to take a ferry to um there is a a a plot where this hollywood actor is going to be directing as a play much ado about nothing at this like um well it's actually a movie theater but that's because they can't get a real theater or a um like a theater theater Mm -hmm. uh and then but his sister they're kind of estranged but not really and then his niece was kind of a child star but then gave it up to be a tiktok celebrity but then like she had drama so she's home now for the summer and they're all working on this play they're all doing it together nothing happens like i know that i've set it up as like (laughs) oh no the theater falls through but then like in the next line the problem solved like the 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 sister becomes the stage manager or no production manager and she is like you know oh the the pipes are broken i gotta call a plumber so then like next paragraph she calls a plumber and it's fine it it just it it's it's so like light and airy perfect to take to a beach or have by the pool read set it down pick it up you'll remember exactly where you are and if you don't it doesn't really matter so like but it's so enjoyable like i know i'm saying i know i'm not really selling this book effectively as like something that engages you and captivates you it does it just kind of floats along so that to me is what you look for in a beach read and and uh, I, it's apparently, a, I guess, part of a, a loosely connected series, a summer beach read uh, universe where, like, sometimes you can tell when a side character will pop in and they're too specific to, like, not have their own story. Yeah. There's some of that, okay. but it also you know, it doesn't really matter. You can pick it up wherever you want. So anyway, that is my beach read recommendation that I'm shoehorning in to this spare for the experience of communal reading, uh, but really bad Cree by Jessica Johns. If there was, you know, like Reese Witherspoon has a book club and yeah. Oprah does or did or whatever. Um, if there was like an overdue finds book club, I think bad Cree would be, be on there as like an official selection it's been recommended a couple times and yeah um yeah i have not read it yet but um i need to put a, i need to put a hold on it uh spare is interesting your your analogy of it because as somebody who just you know pays attention to news and popular culture and everything you know hearing all these interviews i was like i don't think i need to read the book like <laughs> yeah. 
correct. You, yeah. uh, you uh, assessed that one accurately. All of the, the big revelations were covered um, in the book. Uh, my personal theory, uh, the book is divided into three sections. Um, one of them uh, it feels heavily written by the ghostwriter. One of them feels heavily like, no, Harry took this one on himself. And then I think there's another one that is um, perhaps Megan influenced in there. But by now, you know everything that's in it. A little bit of a quick side story since we're talking about Prince Harry. There was um, a really funny episode of South Park, actually, that came out this year around the time when uh, Spare uh, came out. And of course, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, Harry and Meghan Markle were talking about wanting their privacy and everything. So South Park kind of made fun of them because they're like, give us our privacy. And then they moved to South Park and they're having all these wild parties and everything. And they're complaining that people are taking their photos and everything. So um, we don't have it in our collection, but if you can go out and find that episode of South Park, because actually there was rumors that they were going to actually sue uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone from South Park because of it. So it, it's really funny, though. It's a good kind of uh, um, kind of skewer, I guess, at um, <laughs> our media coverage today. So it's it was fairly accurate. Yeah. So how about you, Bryce? What is your pick? Yeah, so uh, my pick, actually, um, I am not quite done reading it yet, but so far, I'm loving it. It's a big book. It's like 700 pages long, so Whoa. this is this is a big one for me. I'm, I'm having, I'm enjoying working my way through it. Yeah, much like Spare, my pick is actually nonfiction as well, and it is uh, LeBron by Jeff Benedict. So yes, this is uh, kind of the biography, well, this is the biography of basketball superstar LeBron James. Uh, Jeff Benedict, um, he also wrote a book about Michael Jordan a few years ago as well. Uh, so the book itself is kind of based on his, he's done like three years of research. He interviewed over 250 people for this book. Um, it's just very, it's very fascinating. It's really an in-depth biography about one of the most iconic sports figures. Um, some say actually too, there's of course that debate and those sports fans out there like myself, whether or not LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time. You could definitely make that case because uh, just actually earlier this year, he uh, he surpassed uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to become the leading scorer in NBA history. So you can't uh, ar- you can't really it's hard to argue against those results. But the book itself, actually, it's it's neat because it actually opens in 2010 with LeBron's ill-fated ESPN special, The Decision. This is where he tells his hometown Cleveland Cavaliers and the rest of the world that he's taking his talents to South Beach. So kind of it was definitely a very infamous uh, infamous sports special on ESPN at the time. And uh, from there, it kind of goes back. Uh, we learn about LeBron and his uh, mom, who is a single parent uh, trying to survive in Akron, Ohio. And basically, it kind of leads us into uh, you know his time as this high school phenom, and of course, to become NBA's all-time leading scorer. Um, it's interesting too with him because LeBron James, for the longest time, and he's been criticized with just recently, actually, because before he really tried to kind of stay out of anything controversial. He's got all these endorsements and everything, and he's kind of. You know, there's no more Michael Jordan is the face of the NBA. It's really LeBron James is the face of the league. So, you know, he stays out of kind of any sort of like political discussions or anything. But, you know, we we see as he uh, grows older and he matures, he starts, you know, getting into things like uh, so he was uh, he starts getting into things like politics where he was campaigning for Hillary Clinton, speaking out against Donald Trump and, of course, uh, showing his support for um, the Black Lives Matter. Uh, movement for me i'm a big fan of sports biographies and this is everything that you want in a biography um it's you know it's a player that you know really likes his privacy so it is kind of neat to get kind of get that uh, insider knowledge about him and his family and then of course he has his like 
his team around him, basically guys he went to high school with who were still kind of in almost like consulting roles uh, with LeBron. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really fascinating read for any, any sports fans. And, uh, yeah, it's just... Um, even too, for if you're not necessarily a sports fan, I, I think that er, anybody could agree that LeBron James is one of the most iconic sports figures probably of all time. Like you put him up there with Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali, like hundred years from now, everybody will know who LeBron James is. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, the only thing I would probably say negatively about the book is that I kind of wish that this book would have maybe came out after he retired so yeah i was just gonna to ask you about yeah. that yeah like i said i'm not done reading it but still i mean the guy's still playing um there's rumors that he won't retire he wants to try and play an nba season with his son Bronny. so we'll, we'll see what happens there I, I really hope he does play for another few years and gets to maybe have a season uh, playing with his son i think that'd be really cool it's never happened before in the nba so um yeah, it's just it's just a really fascinating read about uh, one of the most iconic figures today. Uh, Bryce, you have me wondering how I'm going to squeeze a 700 page book into my to read <laughs> list on this, and I genuinely do not think I've ever watched a full basketball game. So that's quite an accomplishment on your salesmanship for here for this <laughs> book. I have a tactile question: Are you reading it in print? And if so, like how does a giant book like feel to read <laughs> i'm not reading it in print i'm reading oh, it on go. ebook um i actually got it right away i didn't have to wait so this is another one too this is a fairly new book and if you are interested uh you should be able to actually get a copy right away um so yeah but i have read it's funny because Oh, a few years ago, I was reading Stephen King's It, which notoriously is is this huge book. And I would take it on the bus with me every day. It would take up most of my backpack. And our former marketing director, Ana Alfonso, would kind of make jokes, uh, kind of uh, make make fun of me because I kept like hauling around this huge dictionary of, of a book with me. So, yeah, it kind of hurts the wrists and everything at first. But once you kind of get through that halfway point, you're like, this is all right. You're, you know... Start developing yeah. a little bit more muscles and stuff in your wrists and hands. <laughs> yeah, it needs a really solid binding, too. Yes. Because you're going to be, you know, cracking it open uh, in all different situations. But that's really neat. And I think that, yeah, just the more kind of looks we can have at these these public figures who like trying to understand yes the sports aspect of it but then also what is someone's tipping point from going from having a very neutral kind of public facing persona to getting politically involved like what is that line i think having looking at that um those conversations and seeing people as like full people and not just one aspect of their their lives uh yeah sounds like a really interesting read yeah i'm sure that who knows maybe you know a couple of years we'll get the second half after he's retired of uh, of that story but uh this is really fascinating stuff especially kind of going from uh you know akron ohio where they moved from house to house because they didn't have any money for electricity and you know to become essentially lebron james is a is a billionaire it's a fascinating story Bryce, in our recent road trip episode, uh, you brought us all the way up to the mid 80s in terms of tunes. So we're going to jump ahead today. What's been your favorite song or album so far this year? So with that road trip episode, like like you just said, I left yeah. off in the mid 80s. What if I told you my favorite album so far this year is from a band who was fairly popular in the mid 80s? Would you be surprised by that? No, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because uh, one of my favorite albums so far this year is from a band that actually got fairly big in the kind of mid 80s, uh, thanks to the LA rock scene. And that's LA Guns and their new album called Black Diamonds. So it's funny because I've only recently started uh, actually listening to LA Guns. Uh, they're an American kind of glam metal rock band from LA. They formed in uh, 1983. And they're kind of like really big in uh, 
kind of the Sunset Boulevard, Whiskey A Go Go, a rock scene in that era. I actually learned more about them when I read the book Nothing But a Good Time, uh, the uncensored history of 80s hard rock explosion by Tom Bajor that came out last year. And I believe I actually have talked about on the, on the show before. Uh, so I learned more about them uh, from there. Uh, but basically, L.A. Guns, actually, uh, their original members were actually uh, formed with another band to... So some original members of, of L.A. Guns, they broke off, and then they actually helped form another band, which you may have heard of, called Guns N' Roses. So, uh, yeah, L.A. Guns is very, very influential uh hair metal band from that era uh but yeah their new album is called like i said it's called black diamonds it's a it's a great listen if you're into kind of hard rock like i am um yeah i love kind of going back to that 80s hair metal sound uh their first album i uh, sorry their first single from the album is actually called diamonds it's a little bit of a slower song but overall uh great um I really like the first uh, song on the album called You Betray, and the song uh, Like a Drug is hard rock at its best. Um, this is just a fun fun album and a great throwback, so you know, a lot of people like myself will complain like, oh, rock is dead, and there's not as many, you know, today's music isn't as good, but uh, I'm not going to go that far and say that, but you know, for me, since that's kind of the music I like, kind of that classic rock sound, this album by LA Guns was uh, is great. Um, so yeah, we, you can actually, we have the album on order right now, so you can go ahead and uh, put a hold down on it. Um, and also to you, uh, on Hoopla, uh, they have a, one of their albums from uh, 1988, I believe, on there, which you can, you can listen to. So uh, yeah, go, go check out LA Guns. They're awesome. I also am channeling the 80s with my pick. And again, Bryce, what if I told you that my pick is a cover of a very famous song from the 80s? I'd Would be, you be surprised. Shocked. I'm still trying to pick my job off my desk here. So that part's not shocking. But if in January I told you that I was going to have... Um, a country song as my best of the year. That might be a bit surprising because I don't usually talk about country unless it is to say that Shania Twain has one of the best selling albums of all time and does not get the respect and uh, recognition around how many units uh, she has sold in terms of albums. But today I'm talking about Fast Car, originally by Tracy Chapman, covered this year by Luke Combs. I don't know, there was a bit of discussion online, uh, Fast Car being Tracy Chapman's most, arguably her most famous uh, song, most successful song, breakthrough song, uh, a really personal story about kind of her experience, um, you know, the trying to make something of herself, break a cycle of uh, poverty and uh alcoholism and different and uh other things going on uh with her her family and her her life and uh you know then you have someone else covering it and to be fair it has been covered many times in the decades since it was first released but um Luke Holmes does a very faithful adaptation, not changing any of the lines, including one that refers to uh, Singer, the narrator, being a checkout girl, working as a checkout girl. And he just sings it straightforward because he's talked about his respect for Tracy Chapman as a songwriter. Um, There's something just so lovely and like sad about this song honestly i put it on and just like immediately wanted to start crying so if you are it's a very specific genre again it's one of my like micro categories but if you're looking for a song that like gives you that feeling of wanting to like wrap up on a blanket lie down and just cry for a while this is the song for you um highly recommend uh checking it Oh, it's off of his album uh, Getting Old, which was released earlier this year. Um, I cannot speak to any other Luke Combs song. I'm still kind of exploring that. And honestly, what it is more likely to do is to get me 
going back to other Tracy Chapman songs around um, her music, but it's one of those things where, uh, you know, the, the, the more, more people are exposed to the Luke Combs version, hopefully they will check out um, Tracy Chapman's uh, original and, uh, uh, her other other pieces. Um, I think I saw online when I was doing making some notes for this that because the song the Luke Combs version is going to number one on the the country charts, and so Tracy Chapman is going to be the first black woman to have a solo writing credit on a number one song. And there's a few caveat, there's a few like uh, qualifiers in that, but you know, when we're still having firsts for, for, for people, it's, it's like, wow, that uh, should have happened maybe a while ago, but uh, you know, good for her. And uh, I also saw an estimate that she, that the royalties for the song are in like the half a million dollar range. So Yeah, go out there, listen, stream, check it out, and uh, yeah. We we love our movies here on Overdue Finds. Um, You you admitted to me before we hit record today that you weren't quite as current on your 2023 movies, so I'm really curious to see what your pick is here. Yeah, I uh, was looking back this this one we were joking a few moments ago about the would you be surprised if and I actually was surprised when I looked back through my list of movies that I've watched this year I have seen so few actual 2023 movies and many of the ones I have seen have been on streaming services and so not available to borrow from the library. So really I was left with one pick which I'm okay with. It's a good it's a good, you know, I've talked a little bit about it on the show before, uh, but that is Scream 6, uh, which was released earlier this year. I don't think I had seen it at the time I talked about the Scream uh, franchise or series, but I did subsequently watch it, and uh, yeah, it was fun. It, uh, ha- the probably my f- the fa- my favorite part of it was... Um, the subway scene uh, and people who've seen Scream 6 will know uh, what I'm talking about. It's uh, ha- a Halloween night. It's The action has moved to New York City uh, and uh, the the main characters are on this these subway cars that are full of people in famous like horror movie costumes um they're trying they're running from uh ghost face but like everywhere they turn there's another kind of like evil figure around there and everyone is kind of looking menacing or suspicious so um just watching that all play out uh was probably the my one of the my favorite parts of that movie um i don't i every time I watch, I'm kind of like on my phone uh, being like, okay, what was the backstory here? Or what's the, like, there's a lot. And it's also like self-referential that even though this was in many ways, like a fresh start for the franchise, uh, there's still a lot of, you know, lore and past characters and, you know, these questions of just like, how do you move on from your life? And how do you, uh, once you've experienced something that like really shakes you and um, challenges how you see about how you see everyone in your world, how do you move on from that? And I mean, that's been part of the Scream franchise since the beginning, but, um, you know, in today's world where, uh, there are always cameras and people filming and online stories and everything. So yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm, you know, looking forward. I'll probably check out Scream 7 whenever it comes (laughs) out. Um, so, uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing some more, uh, movies from this year in the second half of the year. Well, if you need any suggestions, I've seen a lot of them so far this year year and okay. uh, yeah it's funny uh scream scream six i it's funny because that's actually one of the movies i have not had a chance to see yet this year uh, i did look pretty cool though like especially like i yeah. i from the trailer you got to see a little bit of that subway scene but that's one thing i heard about the movie was that was really cool scene anyway yeah 
there always there are definitely still moments where it's like what are you doing uh (laughs) so those are always fun to to kind of have and questions where it's like how did you survive that you did not survive that but you know again enjoy stuff so yeah yeah. enjoy stuff (laughs) okay so you've seen a number of movies i'm really curious what's kind of risen to the top for you so I've seen some great movies so far this year, but the one that really stands above the rest is Sisu. So basically the plot is this. During World War II, a uh, solitary prospector uh, kind of uh, discovers discovers some gold out in uh, northern Finland, and he unfortunately crosses paths with some Nazis. Now this is kind of towards the tail end of the Second World War. So these soldiers really have nothing to lose. They know they're kind of on the... Um, losing end of the war uh these nazis uh they decide to steal his gold but then they quickly discover that he's no ordinary miner so uh the prospector is actually played by finnish actor jorma tomia and this is basically like watching john wick's grandfather like discover (laughs) gold and he has to take on all these nazis by himself like it's just a crazy action movie it's over the top violent it this one pulls no punches at all um so this this is something that like you know in the 70s they had these like grind houses where you'd watch like all these like really kind of obscure over the top horror movies and action movies this one would have been totally would have played in some of those grindhouse uh theaters at the time uh but yeah this is one where it's like if you like john wick movies you will absolutely love sisu so we also had john wick 4 come out this year which also by the way was excellent um but sisu for me was just stood above the rest like we don't have any big stars in this movie it's a very simple plot prospector finds gold nazis uh nazis uh steal it and prospector goes on a revenge uh streak and basically wipes out a platoon of nazis i'm not spoiling anything you can see that in the trailer you know what you're getting from it uh no real twists or turns with it this is just a fun like popcorn action movie i absolutely love this movie this is one where i will probably buy it and add it to my own personal collection that's intense it is it is so i mean if you don't like over the top violence stuff and i I totally get it's not everybody's cup of tea uh, you you probably will want to skip this it's definitely more gory than um like the john wick movies are anyway but uh yeah if you like your like hard rated r action movies this is this is a good one yeah and we do have it in our collection right now it's on order put your name down for a hold we will get lots of copies and it should go by really quick good well i uh yeah might need to come to you for some recommendations of which other 2023 movies i need to check out so i will quickly mention too there's a couple other movies as well they are in our collection you can put your name down on a hold and i will i will chat about these movies on a later episode uh but uh blackberry movie was really good as well it's a canadian film just came out on uh, dvd and uh, knock at the cabin door uh from m night Shyamalan. uh dave batiste is in it um great movie so those are right really kind of my three favorites so far this year Ooh, yeah i'll definitely need to check those out uh every year i think this is going to be the year i expand my gaming and so far that really hasn't happened but still you know there's still lots of the year left do you have any games to recommend so far this year uh yeah you know it's funny caroline because i i still play a lot of call of duty i've mentioned this a lot on the show the dmz mode in call of duty modern warfare the current one is so fun play online against other people you can work as teams uh complete objectives that's when uh, honestly i've been playing mostly that so far this year but there are there are a couple other games that really caught my attention that are that are fun and uh so yeah first of all 
and this is going to be no shock to anybody, but if you're a Switch owner, of course, kind of the one game you for sure want to get is Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, this one came out uh, just a couple of months ago. And of course, like all the Legend of Zelda games, like they're always popular. Um, Storyline's great. Action, kind of the, the controls on it are, are really good. Um, so we do have it in our collection and you can definitely get it from us. Um, so it's, by the way, I just wanted to mention it's, it's nice that we do have that option too. We have Switch games, PlayStation, and Xbox. So no matter what your kind of gaming tastes are, uh, we really kind of have you have you covered that way. But um, yeah, the new Le- Legend of Zelda game, uh, definitely check that out. I think most people have, so that's why it's not really too much of a shock me mentioning it. Uh, now, besides Call of Duty, though, the other game that I that I'm actually loving. It just came out. We do have it in our collection and that is street fighter six. Caroline, as a kid, I remember when street fighter two came out in arcades. This was like the early nineties. And this just kind of takes you back to the time period because like, I remember I would go to the seven 11 and there would be a lineup of kids waiting to play street fighter two and it was totally like you put like your quarter down so there would be a guy there there would be somebody there uh some kid who was probably super quiet and he would just be like destroying other kids like <laughs> people would line up to try and fight him and of course like they they would lose all the time so uh, this is a street fighter series is something I, i've grown up with and it's it's always kind of been been there for me i want to say anyway but uh yeah, so it's it's funny because Street Fighter is such an interesting series because we've had so many titles and different variations of it over the years. Yeah, this is Street Fighter 6, but I think there's been like 7 or 8 different Street Fighter games to be to be honest with you. And for the most part, uh, if you're not familiar with the Street Fighter games, it's just one versus one like you are fighting one person it's not like mario where you're running through levels or anything it's just one-on-one fighting and you do certain moves so the series is what it is and like um so what i really like about this one is it, it kind of there's little there's features in it that may kind of almost like reinvent the fighting game so we've got like if you don't want to play against people online you can play the world tour mode so that's like a single player version um or if you do want to play against people online kind of have that real like early 90s 7-eleven arcade experience uh you can uh play online too and it's cross-platform as well so if you're on xbox you can play a friend who's on playstation which is uh which is really handy um but yeah the the game itself though um for street fighter of course you have like your classic characters like uh ken ryu and my personal favorite chun li Uh, overall i think there's about 18 different fighters to choose from the thing i like about this game the most though is that for most of these fighting games, your character has like one set of moves. So like Chun Li's got her kick that's you know her supersonic kick or whatever, and everybody's got their own specific moves. But the more you play this game, you can actually your character can learn the other players, the other fighters' moves, which is oh, really neat. cool. Yeah. And sometimes with these games too, there's different combos you need to learn uh, to do specific moves. And sometimes it's like they're next to impossible. It's like up, up, down, down, hit right trigger and X, and then you can do a punch or whatever. Um, I did find that the combos in this game were fairly easy to do. And um, so that's not always the case in a lot of fighting games. But uh, Street Fighter VI, we have it on PlayStation, Xbox, you can play it online, super fun. Caroline, one of these years, we will get you hooked up with like a PlayStation or an Xbox or Switch or something and uh, see what your gaming journey is like. Yeah, I, I every year I think maybe this is going to be the year and it just uh, hasn't uh, happened yet. I have been playing a lot of a new uh, app-based game that I've uh, downloaded and this is really going to help with my like 
cred as someone who's hip and with it and got my finger on the pulse of what's happening now, it's a cribbage app. And uh, I just got in the mood where I felt like I wanted to play cribbage. But like, what am I supposed to do? Play against myself and like with the get the board and the pegs. And uh, so instead, I was like, I bet there's an app for that. And I looked and I found um, just a free uh, cribbage game app that I I have been playing and enjoying. So I am uh, constantly running through uh, my head trying to uh, think of ways to get to uh, 15 and 31. So been enjoying that. Nice. That's a game I've never learned how to play. Um, really? So yeah. Yeah. I've seen people play it countlessly. I know it's a very big uh, popular game when people go camping, obviously, but uh Never. Uh... I've read something that like everyone, everyone's like weekend cottage has a crib board uh, in there hanging around. Uh, it reminds, as I'm playing, it reminds me of my uh, grandparents, which is not to say that only grandparents play cribbage, but mine uh, did. And uh, it's just kind of nice to have those memories um, of it. Uh, I play against the uh, the computer in my head but it's the the app um and uh it, yeah they the i don't it has three modes easy standard and like pro and so i'll play pro lose a couple games and then go back to easy to feel better about myself so um it does uh also you know give some kind of scaffolded help as you go along if you're uh especially when i when i first started playing again i was like wait what am i trying to do what's a good move here um so it does help out with that uh and then by the time you're in the pro mode you're on your own so yeah I'm I'm having fun with that. Nice, yeah. That that yeah, that's awesome. I it's funny too because I'm a big fan of Monopoly as well. And I find it's like very like similar to that where it's like if you know you can't find somebody to play with, you're like oh, I really want to play Monopoly, but yeah. So I I got a game for a Monopoly game for my Switch earlier this year. I don't I don't think it came out this year per se, but yeah, sometimes it's just fun to play those games against a computer. So it's fun. So, uh, you know, we talked, we joked a little bit about movies, Caroline. You haven't had a chance to see that many 2023 movies. But what about TV shows? Uh, have you had a chance to check out any new shows this year? Yeah, I am I have a number of, of shows, surprisingly. I think I've kind of gone back and forth the last couple of years around, uh, you know, what I'm watching. And I would say the majority of my watching is still older stuff uh not <laughs> recent or current series on there but one um that uh i did want to talk about is a uh documentary series that was just released on crave the streaming uh service crave so we don't have it in our collection but we do have the book that the documentary is based on and that is the billionaire murders the story of barry and honey Sherman. Caroline, I'm so glad you brought this up because I just finished watching that on the weekend. Oh, uh, we have so much to talk about, Bryce. So this is a book by uh, Kevin Donovan, who is an investigative reporter uh, with the Toronto Star, and it's much of it's as much about his experience in trying to report on the case and the roadblocks he ran into both like um you know the police throwing up these walls or taking out legal measures that were like unprecedented around it and his like actually going to court around uh, trying to get some uh documents uh released uh that generally would uh the the m murders the the are as yet unsolved. Um, they happened uh, several years ago, and it's been a long time with like no actual leads. The police kind of say different things at different times. Their uh, uh, allegations around how they mishandled the case, and then you look online and you get 
it's so easy to get wrapped up in like a theory of like, well, no, the police didn't mishandle the case. They just want you to think that so that they can throw you, the suspects off. And it's like, oh, this goes way deeper than than you think. But um, it, it's a really kind of interesting look at um, this murder of these these people that you know, you think, how could this not be solved? Or how could the people, the police, the investigators, how could this have unfolded this way? And then, um, yeah, so you, you kind of go into the documentary knowing that there's not going to be that closure. Um, I was still kind of hoping that they, like, wrapped it up with, like, oh, and by the way, this person did it, which they don't. Um, so, yeah, we don't have the, the TV show, the four-episode documentary um, in our collection, uh, but we do have the book. And from what I've found, the book uh, then became a podcast, then became the TV show. So they're all kind of very similar in their content. We will talk off air yeah. because I want to get your thoughts on a few things and I don't yeah. want to spoil stuff nor yeah. make accusations about people who may not have done yes. certain things. So yeah, it's, I, I mean, I can just, I've not read the book. I can just, I can definitely uh, agree with Caroline for sure on, on the love of that, that mini series. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really good. Yeah. Then uh, I have one other pick, Bryce, and that is uh, a show I th I don't, I think, I know we've talked about it, but I can't remember if you said you've ever watched it, but that is uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. I have not watched it Okay, <laughs> so that's okay. There's a lot to catch up on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, earlier this year, RuPaul's Drag Race Season 15 aired. Uh, and this is the kind of what they call like the the flagship show, the American competition show. Um, it it got mixed reviews because they were playing around with like the length, and there was a big cast, and you never really felt like you got to know the drag queens. But let me set the stage for you for one of probably my favorite moments of the year. I watch it all the time. On one side, you've got drag queen Anitra. The other side of the stage, you've got drag queen Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> they That's have uh, been. They've they've landed in the bottom for the child for the challenge that week. They're going to have to lift sync for their life. One of them is going to be eliminated. The song this week is uh, Doja Cat's "Boss B." which I'm not going to say on the podcast, but that starts be that starts playing. You immediately get like this thumping bass sound as they go into this series of like voguing or perhaps more accurately, noging dance moves, tearing up the stage. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha goes into like an exorcist crab walk on the stage and Anitra chooses that moment to do a free willy jump over <laughs> Marsha ending with a roll perfect timing amazing they continue to go on there are splits there's leaps there's twirls it is it is so they're playing off each other but not in like that terrible way where like one person is getting in the other's way they are both stars in this it ends you think it's going to be a double chante which means they both would stay but no one of them is in fact eliminated in that setting off cries of crying in the social media world around is this fair how could you um but it's it's just amazing. So if you think RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, Doja Cat, or uh, uh, voguing is your thing, and you haven't seen this this dance number, go check out this lip sync for your life. Wow, wow! Yeah. It's uh, I'm gonna have to check out the lip sync. I I'll be honest, I'm probably not gonna sit through the whole season to get there. I will definitely I will watch the lip sync. <laughs> 
so yeah, so I mean, there's there's no shortage of it. Again, we don't have um, RuPaul's Drag Race in the collection um, in our list. We'll have some of the the books around it. There's an oral history, I think, of RuPaul's Drag Race coming out later this year if it hasn't already been released. Um, but yeah, between that, uh, Canada's Drag Race, All Stars. France, Mexico, there's a lot. So it's like, where do you even start on that? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. much so much TV to watch. So does your uh, TV pick have someone doing a free willy leap um, over a uh, backwards crab walking drag queen? Mm, let me think. No, I don't think so, actually. I really <laughs> don't. It would have been an interesting take in a couple of the shows I, i'm about to recommend uh but the first one though is a show that everybody knows the name of it and it's cool because scenes of this first season were actually filmed here in edmonton um i remember there's a scene on rice howard way i was like i walk by that like a few days a week it's awesome so of course i'm talking about the first season of The Last of Us, which came, which you can watch on uh, Crave right now. But good news, it is on out on DVD, which uh, isn't the case for a lot of new shows. So uh, once again, I would recommend putting your name down for a hold if you haven't had a chance to check out The Last of Us yet. But uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the show, of course, it is kind of a, it, it, the show is based on uh, the PlayStation game, uh, but the storyline really is. Uh, it, we start out in the year two thousand three, and there's this parasitic fungal infection that ravages the planet. It turns humans into violent creatures known as the infected. Twenty years later, we have a survivor by the name of Joel, who of course is played by Pedro Pascal. He's hired to sm uh, to smuggle a 14-year-old girl by the name of Ellie, who's played by Bella Ramsey, out of uh, basically a quarantine zone in hopes of of delivering her to a rebel a rebel group called the Fireflies. Now, the reason why, of course, uh, he's got to smuggle her out is because uh, Ellie, for some reason we don't quite know yet, is immune to the infected. So she can get bit by kind of some of these these creatures and not get sick. So they're trying to um, figure out what it is about her blood that basically can help save the planet. So this is a this is an awesome show. Um, and what's neat about it too is, of course, we do have those scenes in Rice Howard Way, which you'll recognize some businesses. But of course, there's a whole episode where uh, they're at uh, the ledge here in Edmonton as well. So if you want to see the ledge like blow up, kind of, uh, go check out <laughs> the first season of uh, The Last of Us. So the show itself, it, it's, it's really entertaining, but at the same time, uh, but at the same time, it's brutal. It's heartbreaking. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a really neat show. If you kind of miss the early days of The Walking Dead, um, I would put this, I this is better than the early seasons, obviously, of The Walking Dead, but uh, it's really neat to see some Alberta landmarks in the show um yeah it's just it's a great show and i will say about it i wasn't nuts about the season one finale but that's kind of how the the way the video game ends as well so we are going to be getting more seasons of the last of us so uh go check it out if you haven't had a chance yet so uh, i was very happy to see that it's out on dvd nice it's always kind of fun to see places you recognize on screen. Uh, another show, too, I want to recommend. Uh, it's still airing right now, so uh, there's no physical release for it, but hopefully there will be by the end of the year. And that's actually uh, the show Bup Kiss starring Pete Davidson. It's surprisingly good. I, I'm i one of those people, I remember when he was on SNL, I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Like I never found him to be that funny or charming or anything like that. Like I'm totally, I was totally on the fence of those people being like, I, I don't get Pete Davidson, but uh, this show, if you're not familiar with it, it is kind of like a uh, more of a fictionalized telling of his life. We see him as a, as a celebrity um, kind of trying to navigate 
that. And of course, he still lives at home with his mother and all of that stuff. So um, if you get a chance, go check out Bup Kiss, and hopefully we get a physical release for it so you can uh, check it out later on this year. But uh, I'm I'm loving that show. That's a show I look forward to uh, every Thursday night. Another uh, kind of honorable mention shout out, uh, Shelved, the series we oh, talked yeah. about earlier uh, this year on the podcast. Go check that out as well and uh go back and check out our episode where we talk about kind of what the show gets uh right and what it stretches the truth on uh in terms of libraries on screen so before we get to our roundtable questions bryce can you let our listeners know what's coming up on our next episode uh which is coming out on friday july 28th caroline on the w- a week before this episode comes out, on July 21st, the movie going public, in my humble opinion, I don't think is quite ready for the massive showdown that is Oppenheimer and Barbie. I mean, you can be on either team. I think it's hard to be on both, but this this is a big box office showdown. And we thought on the next episode of Overdue Finds, We're going to celebrate one of the most anticipated movies of the summer by chatting all about Barbie. So everything from, in addition to the movie, we're going to chat about the uh, the history, the toy line, all the different movies and books that you can borrow from us. This is going to be interesting. When I grew up, I did not have any sisters. (laughs) So I'm not obviously that familiar with Bar- like I know of Barbie. So I have a feeling I've got a lot of research to do before we record this next one. I don't I don't know. I I'm torn between, you know, saying like, yeah, dive deep on the research or just going in completely um, you know, as as a new eyes to Barbie and the thing. Like I am already like really cutting down on I'm like well I can't just talk about my favorite Barbies. Yeah, it's been it's been really funny here to watch over the last few weeks and it's like I saw a shirt the other day where it's like they combined Barbie and Oppenheimer. It's like Barbenheimer and it's like got a pink atomic cloud rising out from it and people are having fun with this. So uh yeah, I think it's and I didn't realize until you mentioned it we have so much Barbie stuff in our collection that, yeah, it's. It, I'm looking forward to this one. Despite knowing next to nothing about the topic, I know more about the fictional Malibu Stacy from The Simpsons than I do the real life Barbie. That that will definitely come in handy uh, <laughs> during during the episode. Yeah. So for our roundtable questions, first one, Bryce. We've shared some great titles so far, but is there a title that hasn't come out yet that you think will make our best of 2023 list? Uh, it was a movie we just mentioned, not Barbie. I'm on Team Oppenheimer, obviously. Uh, I'm really looking forward to watching it. Um, I think it's going to be probably Christopher Nolan never disappoints. Like even you know uh, some of his movies that aren't necessarily my favorite are still better than probably 95 percent of movies that are released. So uh, for me, it's uh, Oppenheimer. I'm looking really looking forward to it. How about you? For me, it's Barbie, and uh, <laughs> that, that could not have been set up any better. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm really trying to temper my um, expectations for it. At first, I was kind of like, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm a you know a bit nervous around this. I don't know if it's. Then we started to see some of the, like the trailers and the footage and the everything, and it's like I've been getting more and more excited. Um, I need to probably pull back a little and have like realistic expectations um, for the movie. But um, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing Barbie and if it uh, lives up to what we've seen from the the trailers, then I think I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, no, it, you know, what? I, I joke around, of course, that, you know, I'm not really interested in Barbie, but I will say that um, not just because of the hype, but the trailer actually does make it look quite funny. And as uh, somebody who grew up obviously playing G.I. Joe's in hockey, I will say it like I'm actually looking forward to watching it as well. It looks really fun. Uh, so let's take a look back 10 years ago to the year 2013. If Overdue Finds was around then, what's one title that you think would have made your best of the year list? 
I've got a tie here. So one is a book. Uh, first one is uh, the book Dr. Sleep by Stephen King. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is actually the sequel to The Shining. It is way better than it has any right to be, uh, especially following up on something as classic as The Shining. Um, yeah, if you haven't read Dr. Sleep, go check it out. And the movie, too, that came out just a few years ago starring Ewan McGregor is also excellent. So, um Go check it out if you can. And uh, for my movie pick, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, the Martin Scorsese film. Uh, the movie is so watchable, even though uh, the real life story is, you know, that guy is uh, not a good person. But uh, it's to me, it's a very enjoyable movie. How about you, Caroline? I also had two. Uh, the first one was the movie Francis Ha, uh, directed by Noah Baumbach and starring Greta Gerwig, director of the upcoming Barbie <laughs> movie. Um, I just, I, it's it again. It's a kind of a polarizing movie. I remember so clearly. I saw it at the Princess Theater on White Ave, and after the movie, uh, there were these two women who came out ahead of me, and they were like, they were discussing one of the scenes and is like that was just ridiculous and i'm like that was the point I'm like these people these women i had no idea like i jumped into the conversation to discuss it in front of the princess uh because i just was like that was the point and they're like oh i don't know blah 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 and we got to discussing it but it was um yeah, I, I haven't seen it in a while. Don't know if it holds up, but probably would have been on my list at the time. And then um, a song I have heard does hold up. Still love Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus off of her album Bangers. Yes. Oh, it's just so good to belt out <laughs> that song when you need to. So, yeah, uh, yeah listen to uh, my sad remix from the from earlier in the episode, and then when once you're you're all cried out, then you can get into Wrecking Ball. Once there's no more tears left, exactly like Wrecking Ball time. Yeah, isn't that no tears left to cry? That's an Ariana Grande from the Pete Davidson era. This episode is all coming <laughs> together. It's all a web for sure. So we hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Make sure that you've subscribed so that you get all of our new episodes. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Even more importantly, tell a friend about the show. Make it your mid-year resolution. Yeah, we should have maybe had mid-year resolutions. Yeah. Um, well, oh, mine dear. is to watch more movies. Oh, so, yeah. mine will be to listen to more new music. Okay. So there we go. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Easy. Of course, don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. Um, and of course, we love to hear from listeners. You can reach us on Twitter at epl.ca or email us at podcast at epl.ca. And of course, you can uh, share your thoughts about the show with us on twitter by using the hashtag epl overdue finds thank you for listening and we'll see you next time